more time, please. Oh, great Father God, it's so awesome to know you, to serve you, to love you, and to know that you love us. And Father, we can love you because you first loved us. And Lord, I just count it a privilege to be able to minister to the Woodruff Church family today, to worship with them. Thank you for their kind hospitality and welcoming me and Ginger here today. Lord, I don't want to be the focal point. I want Jesus to shine through. Lord, I want you to be the center of attention. Hide me behind the cross. But Lord, you've called me to be your mouthpiece, so give me the words to say. And tell me when to be quiet. Help me to know when to to sit down. Don't let me linger needlessly. But Lord, give us that mind, that presence, to not be distracted. Take away our distractions and help us to focus on the word that you have for us today. May we not leave this place the same as we came. Let us be changed according to your divine plan for our lives. Wash over us with the blood of Christ as I prayed earlier. Cleanse us every bit. And Father, anoint our minds to follow you, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As I was thinking about what to share this week, my mind went to the idea of tragedy. Question for you. Is our world filled with tragedy, yes or no? I mean, it's almost depressing to look at the news, right? If, if you look at the news and just see what's happening, and, and there's no shortage, right, of, of just absolute foolishness that happens. Cra- things that you just look and you're like, what are people thinking And for me, I I have to just remind myself, hey, it's a sign of the times, right? What did Jesus tell us? Did he say that as it got closer to his return that things would get better or that it would be as it was in the days of Noah? Yeah, it's going to get worse, right? So we can expect, but when we hear about a tragedy, it's heartbreaking. But what about preventable tragedy? Right? I mean, it's one thing to hear about a tragedy, some sort of freak accident, some sort of act of nature. But when I hear about preventable tragedy, that's really what breaks my heart. In thinking about that, my mind went back to July of 2016. Not too long ago, right? But almost seven years ago, this July, on July 23 of 2016, we were pastoring in Michigan. Ginger and I were pastoring at the Metro Church. It's there in the Detroit area. Um, But one of my previous districts, there was a young man who was working at summer camp, and he drowned while working at summer camp. Not at camp, but he had some time off, and so he and some friends wanted to go and explore the area a little bit. They heard that just a few miles from camp there was another lake, because of course camp has its own private lake, Camp Asabo there in Michigan. But just over the road, as you're headed towards Kalkaska, and maybe you've not heard of Kalkaska, but have you ever heard of Traverse City? Yeah, probably more of you have heard of Traverse City, famous for their cherry festival. If you want some of the best cherries in the world, July, Traverse City, go get you some. They're amazing. But there's a lake on the way to Traverse City, and these kids went exploring, and they decided to take a little bit of snorkeling gear to see if they could see anything in the lake. One of the young men was not able to swim. How wise is it to go out and get into the lake when you don't know how to swim? Depends on what you do, right? Now, if I I go out and I'm wading around, I'm probably relatively safe, yes or no? Are you with me, saints? But what if I do something that distracts me, like putting on a snorkel mask and tube, and I start kind of trying to swim around, right? Because the body is kind of naturally buoyant, right? You kind of naturally float. So he's kind of just snorkeling around, trying to get the hang of it, doesn't know how to swim. Before he realizes what's happening, he's gone beyond his ability to stand up, finds himself in trouble. The others are distracted doing their own thing. And unfortunately, George drowned in shallow waters. Something totally preventable. How do you think his parents felt? Talk to me. How would you feel? Right? Again, something totally preventable. Not some sort of, you know, 
a congenital heart defect or something that you didn't know was there, and boom, it kind of surprised you because you're playing a game of basketball or something. We see those things happen. Tragic, but you didn't know it was there, so it wasn't really preventable because you didn't know about it. This was completely preventable. And a young man, 19 years of age, lost his life because he drowned in shallow waters. Heartbreaking. The only solace, really, that we have from this is that George was known to be a young man who loved the Lord. Praise God, there might be a hope that we see George in the future at the resurrection. Amen? But I'll tell you, as much as I appreciate that knowledge, I'm not in a hurry to get rid of the people I love just because I get to see them in the resurrection. Right? I don't... I don't I, I, I don't want to lose my wife. Well, if you lose her, you'll get to see her in the resurrection. I still don't want to lose her. But because of this tragedy, we do have a little something to look forward to. But it was preventable. Could have been avoided. I'm thankful for the wonderful promise. But what if George had just said, you know what? You guys go do your snorkeling. But I'm just going to splash around here at the shore. I'm just going to explore nature. He would often write put his Facebook postings or whatever. He enjoyed nature. He loved being in God's second book. But now a family has lost their eldest son because he drowned in shallow waters. I want you to do a mental exercise with me. You see, one thing that we like to do as humans is we like to revisit things, and we like to, and maybe some of you do this, don't raise your hands yet, but how many of you are overthinkers? Do I, do I have any overthinkers? I've got one sister here. She just dying to confess. Save me, Pastor. Sometimes we're overthinkers, right? And we'll, we'll have something that happens and, and we go back over it and over it and over it and over it. Psychologists have a special term for that. It's called rumination. Now, that might sound a little weird. Some of you are probably thinking, wait a minute, isn't rumination what cows do? It's true, right? Some people, I've had people tell me, well, cows have four stomachs. No, they don't. What cows have is one stomach with four compartments, and and this is amazing. We're going to get this out of the way early so that we're over it before potluck, okay? (laughs) I want want to make sure I process this with you and we move past it. But a cow's stomach has four compartments, and what they do is is they, they, they try to digest it in that first compartment, then they throw it up, They regurgitate it, if we're going to use medical terms. They chew it again, and then they swallow it back into the next compartment. And how many compartments do they have? How many times do they do that? So you chew it up, swallow it. So so that, that is also the process of rumination, but it's that process that then got applied to a mental activity. Do you know anybody that holds on to things? My sister here's already, she she said, free me, Lord. I I need to be freed today. I'm a ruminator. Here, Here is how the American Psychological Society actually defines rumination. Check this out. Obsessional thinking involving excessive repetitive thoughts or themes that interfere with other forms of mental activity. So in other words, right, I'm so focused, I'm, I'm so honed in, I'm, still, I'm, I'm just bogged down on this thing that I put my blinders on and I can't see what else is happening around me and it actually robs me of life because I'm not able to focus beyond that point. Here's a mental exercise I want you to do with me. How many of you can imagine a circle in your minds? Okay, nobody, I'm in the wrong church. I was going to say, did anybody here take kindergarten besides me? I had to draw a lot of circles. Okay, so you can picture a circle, right? I'm not trying to set you up for something, but just imagine in your mind two circles. Are you with me? Okay, and in our mind, we have these two circles. We have one over here, they're separated by a little bit, and you've got another circle over here. In this first circle, the one in my right, your left, I want you to mentally think about things in your life that you cannot change. Give me an example of something in your life that you can't change. It doesn't have to be personal. I'm not trying to get up in your business. 
Your age. Height or lack thereof. So the second part of her statement told me how she feels about her height. Right? Say, I heard a good one. We're past. I can't change it, right? So how many people, though, let me, let me just take each one of these. How many people do you know, though, they get upset about their age? In fact, I was raised, as a good southern boy, you never ask a lady her what? Two things you don't do. You don't ask a lady her age, and you better not ever go in a pocketbook. Did he not get that lesson? Oh, that's, that's my girl there. Square that brother away. Yeah. I'm going to tell you what. My mother would have changed the color of my complexion. You don't go in a lady. And to this day, I'm, I'll be 49 in June. Ginger will send me to get something out of her purse, and I start having tremors. Not doing it. But you don't ask a lady her age. Why? Why, why, why do we get so worked up about that? Why is it not a blessing that you managed to live that long? I mean, listen, I'm excited about telling people when I turn 50, I'm half a century old. That just sounds cool, Bruce. Robin, to, I mean, to me, that sounds cool. You say, well, you're a fool. Well, let me prove it. But I can't change my age. And if I really consider every day, every year of life a blessing from God, why would I be upset that I'm getting older? Right? Now, height. I don't want to ask you how tall you are or how short you are. So you're on the decline there. I hear you. Well, at my peak, I made it to five, seven and a half. Half. Don't you forget my half. I eked out that half. I'm going to take it, right? But there's changes that happen physiologically. What can I do about it? Why would I worry about it? Why, why would I let that be something that bothers me while I'm short? Well, in, in my problem, not only was I short, for the longest time I was way too fat. And I would joke about it and say, listen, I'm not too fat, I'm just too short. So I'd blame one on the other. And I used to, I used to blame the dryer for shrinking my clothes. Found out it was the fridge doing it. Did you know that? Dryer had nothing to do with it. It was the fridge the whole time, shrinking my clothes. Or what I shoved in my face from it. My sister back here, was it you that said your past? Why would I obsess over it? Why would I? Now, let me be fair, right? I don't want to just lay a blanket statement. If there's some things I've done in my past that I've not taken steps to rectify with other people, then maybe I need to go back and revisit some of those things and, and work through that, right? If I've, if, let's say I lived as some sort of hellion and laid a trail of bodies behind me, then I get converted. Bruce, you mentioned that process of sanctification in Sabbath school, right? You said you weren't the same person as you were. Praise God, I'm not either. But if I left a trail of bodies, do I need to try to go back and bring some healing? Yeah, and, and if they don't accept it, I still can't change it but maybe I should take some healthy steps. 12-step programs do this. Reconciliation. I forget which step it is. I want to say six or seven. Somebody help me if you know. Correct me. I'm not sure. But my point is, you can't change these things. Right? So all of those things would be in the first circle, yes or no? How much effect do you have on the weather? But yet, what do people talk about? My wife loves to ask me every morning. How cold is it? How hot is it? How many times have I had to tell you, I don't care? I don't. If it's hot, I'm not going to wear a coat. If it's cold, what am I going to do? Maybe wear a coat. But I can't change it. But yet, how many people worry? We lived in Michigan for a little over 14 years. People would worry about, is it going to snow? Well, you're in Michigan. It's highly likely. There's a weather system moving through that has a lot of moisture. There's a lot of cold air in the upper atmosphere. It's highly likely. Who cares? Plan for it. Move on. Well, we did that too. She said, move out. Ginger's just, amen. We loved our folks in Michigan. She did not care for the weather. She's happy to be back in Carolina. My whole point is, saints, 
There are all of these things, right? We could go through and create this ever-growing list of things I can't change, but yet how many people spend brain power, how many people spend mental energy focusing on things they can't change? What are some things you can change, right? We're, we're leaving this circle over here, now we're going to this circle, and we're going to list some things that we can change. What would fit into the circle that can change? Oh, mercy. Attitude. Anybody ever heard of a motivational speaker by the name of Zig Ziglar? I don't know a whole lot about uh, Mr. Ziglar, but I did hear one of his speeches one time where he recommended that there could be a cure for stinking thinking. Right? He, he said some people end up with stinking, what was it? Thinking. And he said the only cure for stinking thinking is to get a checkup from the neck up. That really stuck with me, right? How many of you have met somebody who could have used a checkup from the neck up? How many times was it you? I can change my attitude. How many times have we prayed for a situation to change and we ask God to change other people, but we don't have a willingness to change ourselves? I'm just, I'm just trying to be a little transparent and I'm not putting you in some sort of boat that I'm not in with you. Right? I've done the same thing. I've had stinking thinking. In fact, sometimes I still do. Ginger has to help me. Sometimes she gets it. I have to help her. We have to love each other enough to address stinking thinking. What's something else I can change? My attitude, very good one. It was on my list. Say again. Habits. I love the science of habits. If you want some interesting reading, if you're into learning those kind of things, every habit that you and I have actually has a physical pathway that has been created in the brain. It is a physical neurological pathway that has been created. And you say, well, why can't I stop doing this? Because you literally have to change your brain to form a different habit. You're, you're fighting against actual physiology. Learn behavior. But if I surrender that to God, can he give me victory over my habits? Amen. Better believe it. What's another example? These are really good. Attitude, habits, priorities. priorities. Dietary habits could be a priority, right? If we want to tie those two together. Anybody in here like to eat more than they should? That's willing to be honest about it. <laughs> I fell into that habit. You know what to me the most magical three ingredients in the world are? You ready for this? This is crazy. I think it's voodoo, but I'm not sure. But three most magical ingredients to me in the world when they're put together is tomato sauce, cheese, and bread. It forms this food item known as pizza. Anybody else find it to just be magical? <laughs> it should be its own food group. Thank you. Are, are you guys with me? Do you agree? Be careful, though. Here's what I found out about bread. The more you eat it, the more you resemble it. <laughs> you eat too many rolls, you'll get too many rolls. All right, work with a brother. I'm telling you from personal experience. A little over a year ago, I weighed 320 pounds. And when you stand five, seven and a half, that's too much. Yes or no? Started making some changes. Lost about 80 pounds. Praise God. I had to put that in my circle of things that I could change. But sometimes we fall into these habits that bring us down, that cause us to fail, and they cause us to fall into things that are completely preventable, and we find ourselves drowning in a number of ways in shallow waters. Here's something else I want to encourage you to put into the circle of things you can change. Are you ready? Your relationship with God. Your relationship with God is something that is completely within your control, whether you're going to have a good relationship with God or whether you're going to have a lackluster experience and it's going to be something that means nothing to you. Is that true, yes or no? 
And I'll tell you, young people, hear me today. You have to come to the place where you choose God for yourself. You may come to church now because parents make you come to church, but I hope that you catch a glimpse of how awesome God is that you want him for yourself. That you don't just say, well, man, I can't wait until I get old enough to where nobody can force me to come to church. Start asking now, why is Jesus worth following? Start asking now, what is so special about Jesus that these people want to give up all the freedom that they have to chase the things of the world and they want to follow Jesus? Ask, why is he so amazing? You see, this relationship with Jesus, sometimes we accept it, sometimes we don't, and sometimes we play the game. <laughs> Take a guess, what percentage of people did not return to church post-COVID? I'm hearing 50, I'm hearing 50 or more. Any other, any other thoughts? Huh? It's estimated. Anybody heard of the Pew Research Center? Yeah, it's, it's spelled just like P, this kind of pew, right? P-E-W. Pew Research Center estimates that around 50% of Christians who attended church pre-COVID did not return post-COVID. You have to ask the question, why? And of, of course, there's going to be a small, a small segment of those people who maybe still have some health concerns, Right? Maybe they have compromised immune systems. Maybe they feel more vulnerable to public interaction, which makes me question sometimes because the same people will go to the grocery store and everywhere else but can't go to church. Maybe COVID was the perfect excuse to stop going somewhere I didn't really want to be to start with. Was that too far, brother? I don't know for everybody, right? And I'm not here to point fingers. As I mentioned in Sabbath school, I can't judge someone's heart, but I do know as a pastor who pastored a church through COVID, right? I wasn't sitting on the sidelines watching it from afar. I lived through it with a church congregation. I know that some people it was just the most convenient excuse to stop doing something I didn't really want to be doing to start with. And, and it hurts my heart. I don't want to think that but you got to find a different reason. Satellite. Well, satellite, and, and there are some people, right? Hey, they're worshiping online. You see my wife filming my sermon today. I record my sermons. I edit them a little bit, put a little splash screen on them, and I post them on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. So if you're having trouble sleeping, go find some of my other sermons, and I'll help you sleep better. <laughs> I'll get you there. I'm not against online. I'm not against... Digital media, I'm not against reaching people with these things, but you cannot replace direct fellowship with people. At some point, you've got to have interaction with people, other people, and we have an epidemic. The pandemic was replaced with an epidemic of loneliness in this country. We were already feeding it because we spend our time looking into devices instead of talking to each other. You couple that now with the distance, loneliness is of epidemic proportion. And this is not Pastor Bentley's opinion. Go read the research for yourself. We have to choose to stay connected to God. And, and, if, and if I claim to know God, yet I don't take the steps to connect with him, I will end up spiritually drowning in what kind of waters? Shallow. And why are they shallow waters? Because it's preventable. I don't have to drown spiritually. I can have a living connection with a living God. You say, well, how do I do it? I want to say this. Hear me. Are you listening? It's very easy, and yet it's very hard. Let's talk about the, the easy part. How much do you have to do to be saved? Oh, mercy, I'm going to have to have another sermon. If we don't understand the basic tenets of salvation. Okay, so I heard, and I don't remember who it was because you were behind me during Sabbath school, but I heard somebody say 
and, and maybe it was during the opening, that we are not saved by works. We're, and Jerry, maybe it was you. I think you were the one quoting it now that I said it. Say it again for us. We are saved by what? Not by works, lest any man should what? We're saved by faith. How hard is it to be saved? Jesus did all the heavy lifting. He's the one that went to Calvary, yes or no? He's the one who felt the accumulated weight of sin and died the second death for me. He did the heavy lifting, saints. Salvation's there, it's free, it's yours for the taking. Anybody in here 15? Do I have any 15-year-olds? You guys close? Getting close, okay. Four, who's the, which one's 14? Okay, so I, can I tell you just a little story? I was 15. Met this girl. I, I was really smart because I chased her. <laughs> the only thing I can credit, I had sense enough to follow Ginger. I tried to invite her to a Friday night dance. I was excited. I found this pretty girl. I was really shy. I wouldn't talk to girls. You don't believe that, but I was really shy. I got over it, but I was really shy. But I finally got the courage to ask somebody else for her number. Because I couldn't just ask her. That'd be too direct. So I stalked her around the school, got her number from somebody else, <laughs> called her up, said, hey, would you like to go to this dance? She said, no, my parents won't let me. Well, why not? I almost had to beat it out over that she was an Adventist. I had no idea what an Adventist was. But I found out that if I followed her to church, I got to spend more time with her. <laughs> so God was leading me into a path where I could have some interactions with him. I had this other guy at school that I was friends with. A guy I met at school, he and I, anybody ever heard of Future Farmers of America? FFA club? I joined FFA because I wanted to learn how to weld. So I joined the club and I met this kid in there. His family ran a dairy farm and he attended a local Baptist church. He showed up to my house one Saturday. I was downstairs sweeping out the basement and he comes up. He's got this 14-year-old boy with him named Cody. And he said, Daryl, have you ever given your heart to Christ? I said, what does that mean? So here he stood there as a 16-year-old with a 14-year-old talking to a 15-year-old. And he explained to me what it meant to give your heart to Christ. And he said, we can do it right now. We can kneel in, down in your basement right here. And he said, and I'll pray and all you have to do is repeat it. 16-year-old kid. So we now, I had no idea what I'm doing. <laughs> but I knew when he described what it meant to be lost, that described me. And so we knelt down there in my parents' basement, and I gave my heart to Christ. I didn't know what I was doing, but it started a journey, right? Yes, that's the easy part of having a relationship with God is recognizing our need of Christ, amen? Recognizing I can't save myself, recognizing I need His salvation. That's the easy part. But what's the hard part? The hard part is, is that we live in a world that hates God, right? I mean, the, the easy, and they'll tell us, you don't need God. He doesn't exist. He's a fairy tale. He's an imaginary pe person. I can only tell you this. The person I was before Jesus is not the same person that I am today. I can't explain how he does that, but all I know is he takes messed up people and he transforms them from the inside out, and he finds a way to save lost people. And you and I can choose God. That's the easy part. Now, anybody ever heard of a guy by the name of John Calvin? Maybe you haven't heard of John Calvin. Maybe you've heard of the Presbyterian Church. John Calvin is the founder of the Presbyterian Church. John Calvin had a teaching that is known as predestination. He said this, God chooses certain people to save. But if he only chooses certain people to be saved, what is he also choosing for the other people? So it's double predestination, some people will call it. Because if I choose you to be saved, and you to be saved, and you to be saved, and you, the rest of you are just lost. 
Because as God, I chose it and you can't change it. There's something that I don't believe Brother Calvin understood. Anybody remember a verse in the gospel according to John? It comes along in chapter 3, and it might be around verse 16. And it might be tied to verse 17. Anybody remember it? For God so loved those that he preordained. Well, wait a minute. God loved who? God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that the elect. Now, here's what's interesting. Most of our English translations, that's right. Whoever or whosoever. The Greek word there is pas. Not pus, pas. I want to make sure you get it right. That preacher went out of here saying the Greek talks about pus that saves you. No, no, no. Hold on. Pas, P-A-S. It simply means all. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that all who choose him might have everlasting life and God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world but that the world through him verse 17 says they might be what saved Saved. how can you miss that so that's the easy part Jesus did the heavy lifting Jesus is the one who saves us what's the hard part the hard part is this we live in a world that tells you you're crazy if you follow God we live in a world where the devil has been very successful at making sin look more fun than following God. Isn't that what he does? Essentially, that's that's what we see. Why, Why would I follow God? It's just a bunch of rules. Well, let's think about those for a second. We'll skip the first four. Let's just go to number six. Anybody remember number six? See, I'm doing to you what a professor of mine did at Southern. I was a senior theology student. My brain was getting big at that point. I knew a lot of big brain stuff. I come into Christian Theo one day, and Dr. Steve Bauer hands each one of us a three-by-five card, and here we are, senior theology students, about to be launched into the world of pastoral ministry. He gives us a three-by-five index card, and he says, write down the Ten Commandments in order. You would not have believed the wailing and gnashing of teeth that rolled through the classroom that day. And here was his point, and it stuck with me. Don't get so smart learning what you think are the deep things of God, and you forget the basics of who Jesus is. We know the first commandment, right? You shall have no other gods before me. What's number two? If you don't remember, I'll give you a clue that it's in Exodus. It's somewhere between chapter 19 and 21. Okay, no idols, no graven images. Don't bow down to them. Don't worship them. Number three, what should I do as it relates to God's name? Don't take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. I can do that by verbally tearing down God's name, or I can take God's name in vain by claiming to be a Christian and living like the devil. True? Number four, I think you know number four, you're here today. Unless you slept here over the week and just happened to be here for Sabbath. You chose to be here, amen? So number five, honor somebody. Honor your father and your mother that your days may be long upon the earth. Number six, how should we feel about life? Should we value life? We had to write these down. We had to list these out. I am here to tell you, I'm not bragging, but I got them all. And I praise God that he's put simple things in my heart too. But we live in a world that says it's okay to kill. Right? And I'm not here to get into any kind of political debate. People, oh, well, you talk about abortion, you're getting political. When I talk about abortion, I'm talking about I want to see innocent life preserved. You can make it a political matter if you want to. For me, it's innocent life, and I believe the Bible says we should protect innocent life. I will not apologize for being against abortion. You can hate me later. Don't shut me off. Finish hearing the sermon. But we live in a country that makes it hard to embrace God because life is not valuable, or 
certain lives are valuable. Am I right? How many of you would affirm with me the statement, black lives matter? Just the statement. I'm not talking about any kind of association with a group. Do black lives matter? Do Hispanic lives matter? Do white lives matter? Do red lives, if we're going to just keep going with a color scheme. Okay, yellow, whatever. Brown, pasty white. Thank God pasty white lives matter too. My point is this. We live in a society where the devil wants us to be polarized against each other. And he wants us to value certain people while not valuing the plight of other people. Let's value everybody. Let's treat everybody with respect, with love. Let's not pit each other against one another. It's not a secret, and it's not God's way. It's hard to live in this world and be dedicated to Jesus when the world tells you that it's a fairy tale. When the world tells you that a growing majority of Christians, Bruce, back to the point of the Sabbath school, embrace theistic evolution. I actually looked up the statistics. Do you know, again, according to Pew Research Center, 60% of Americans believe that humans evolved over time. 60%. Is that the majority, yes or no? It's the majority. And guess what? About 30 2% of those would say that, yes, it was evolution, but it was guided by a supreme being. What kind of evolution is that, Bruce? Theistic That's theistic evolution. Guess what? Only 30%, 30, excuse me, 33% of Americans would say to you that evolution had nothing to do with the creation process. If you believe in a literal creation by a literal God, you're in the minority in this country. How does that make you feel? I really don't care. I'm happy to stand on my own. But does it make it harder to live as a Christian in that type of society today, yes or no? Of course it does. Because if somebody says something and you say, well, I believe God created, well, you're automatically relegated to being some fool because you've bought into a fairy tale. people, atheism is on the rise. Here's a question I want to leave you with. If you run into somebody who claims to be an atheist, here's a question I want to encourage you to ask them. It's very simple and it's not an attack. I don't believe in attacking people. But ask this question. Please describe for me the God that you don't believe in. Because if I'm going to say I don't believe in God, do I have to have some sort of mental understanding as to who that is I'm rejecting? Right? If somebody said, if I told you, I hate special K loaf. <laughs> you know what special K loaf is? Have you been subjected to that? Please tell me. I, 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 oh man, I should have asked before. We're having potluck today, aren't we? If somebody fixed special K loaf, I still love you. I just can't eat it. Why? I don't like the taste of it. And I could question your sanity. <laughs> well, how do you like it? Now listen, I love special case cereal and I love cottage cheese. But when you mix the two together and turn it into some sort of mystery loaf, <laughs> I love you, but I'm not eating it. And listen, I have tried, I've tried close to 30 recipes. And so I don't care if you tell me, listen, ours was handed down from Mrs. White. I'm still not eating it. <laughs> I just don't like it. Right? But I have a basis for what I'm rejecting. Okay? So if, if somebody tells me that I reject the God or I, I'm an atheist, I don't believe in God, I love to ask them, please describe for me the God that you, that you don't believe in. And it's amazing some of the things that they will tell you. Well, God is this, God is that, God is, God is cruel, he's, he's, he's indifferent, he doesn't care about people suffering. And I, sometimes I've been able to look at an atheist and say, listen, if that's who God was, I wouldn't believe in him either. The God you just described, I don't believe in that either. 
And what it does, though, is it opens a dialogue for me then to be able to share about the God that I do know. Right? What are we told in the Psalms? Taste and what? See that God is good. I've tasted so I can talk about it. So in this world, how do I stay connected to God? I want to close by taking you through a passage. It's one of my favorite passages. And I'll say this very simply. The secret to not drowning in shallow water spiritually is intentionality. What's the secret? Say it with me. The secret is intentionality. Being intentional with my walk. Turn with me, if you would, to the book of Philippians. Where are we headed? Philippians chapter 4, please. Philippians chapter 4, and if you'll pick up with me in verse 6, let me know when you're there. Just give me a hearty amen. If you need more time, say have mercy. I told you I get paid by the month. What I believe here is that Paul lays out for the church in Philippi He lays out for them the three spiritual disciplines of the Christian walk. It's very simple. Remember I told you being saved is simple. It's hard, yes, because of environmental challenges. It's hard because of social challenges. But I shouldn't make it harder. Right? And sometimes I make it harder on myself spiritually because I don't cooperate with God. And I ignore the spiritual disciplines. How do you get better at doing push-ups? She said, who cares? Well, (laughs) I was working on the premise that somebody wanted to. How do you get better at playing the piano? Okay, I I had to to get on her level. I had to find something she likes. My point is, well, one way that you get better at push-ups is you do put-downs. You put down the fork. Some intentionality. Right? But then what, what's the next thing that I have to do? If I'm going to get better at push-ups, I have to actually do push-ups. The other day, my son, his goal in life is to beat me in arm wrestling. I don't know why. It's one of these testosterone-fueled fantasies that he has embraced. And somehow he will finally have ascended to manhood when he can beat pops in the... So he wanted to arm wrestle me. Well... When I got tired of being fat, I also started going to the gym. And they have all this metal laying around that they want you to just pick up. So that's what I do. I'll go around and I pick up metal. They call it lifting weights. So we arm wrestled. And I let him him take me back just a little bit. It was fun. I know, I need to pray more. Pray for me, sis. Then I had to put him down. He wanted to do some push-ups. I said, well, you go first. See, I needed to see what my benchmark was. <laughs> this brother's 20. And he, he somehow got his grandpa's height. He's like 6'2", strong. He does his push-ups, and I was so glad he stopped at 40. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just got down and started hammering, and I'm, you know, I'm breathing hard. My face is red. I was afraid this vein in my head was going to pop. <laughs> but when I finished counting, I'd hit 50. I'm not saying that to brag, saints. Please, please don't take it that way. I'm not trying to do that. I'm simply saying because I prayed and asked God to give me strength to be consistent in going to the gym, that intentionality paid off. Does that make sense, yes or no? Same way with practicing the piano. If I practice my scales and if I practice my notes and my sight reading and I practice timing and counting, I'm going to be a better musician at the end of the day, yes or no? It's intentionality. And in this passage, Paul lays out the spiritual disciplines that if you and I are intentional with them, it sets us up for better success. I'm not saying it's mechanical and we save ourselves, but it puts us in a position to commune with God. And if I'm in a position to commune with God, does that increase my relationship usually? Absolutely. Let's walk through it together. Verse 6, Philippians chapter 4. Be anxious for everything... Fret and worry over it all. Some of you are paying attention. You're like, this guy can't read or he's crazy. 
or both? Be anxious for how much? Do you remember Jesus' words? He asked a question. How many of you can add one cubit to your stature by doing what? Isn't anxiety kind of a form of worrying? Now, granted, I'm not going to try to discount that some people have some clinical things going on, some chemical things maybe happening that gives them anxiety they can't control on their own. But setting all of that aside, and sis, if we ruminate on it, I told you not to raise your hand and you did, so you gave me permission to pick it. <laughs> but if I focus on it and I keep coming back to it, have I given it to God or am I still trying to handle it myself? And I want you to notice something here. Check this out. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything. Notice there are three forms of prayer that are brought out here. Everything by prayer, and then what's the next part? Supplication. There are actually two different words in the Greek language here. It's a third one when you get to Thanksgiving. So you say, well, what's the difference between prayer, supplication, and thanksgiving? Prayer in general is praying for spiritual things, right? Praying for spiritual guidance, praying for my walk, praying for understanding. Supplication, what would you guess is the root word in English for supplication? That's all it is. A supplication is asking God to supply something. How many of you get a mortgage or a rent bill every month? I get one. Somebody wants me to pay to live where I live. What happens if I don't pay it? Well, nowadays they have to go to court and six months later they might get their house back. You heard of all this squatter mess that's happening? But at the end of the day, do we have needs, literal needs, genuine needs that we need to ask God to supply for us? Absolutely. And there's nothing wrong with saying, God, take care of my needs. Petition. It's a petition, right? But, but it's a petition where you're specifically asking for something. And maybe I'm asking for me. Maybe I'm asking for you. I shouldn't just focus on my needs. I should focus on the needs of my church family. I heard several of you. I think, sis, you were praying for your family. I heard, was it the Hall family? Somebody mentioned the Hall family. There's some other families that were mentioned. You were praying for their needs, right? For healing. And then what's that last prayer? What kind of prayer is it? How many of you are mindful of your blessings? Can I challenge you? I want to challenge you to do an exercise just this week. If you want to keep doing it after this week, it's between you and God. But I want to ask you to accept a challenge for this week. Young people, I want you to do it too, if you would, please. Would you take the notes app? All the phones have a notes app, right? Somewhere you can take notes. I know the iPhones do it. The Androids do that too. Anybody here have an Android that will admit it in public? <laughs> okay. Use the notes app on your phone this week. And just when you see a blessing in your life, write down that blessing. You would be amazed when you're being intentional about capturing the blessings in your life. You'd be amazed how many blessings you actually have. And I tell you, joys and concerns will look a little different next week because we're being more intentional about catching the praises of God. If you... If you <laughs> You can use pen and paper. You can chisel it in a stone. I don't care if you use papyrus and ink. My only point was, show me somebody who leaves home without their phone. That's the only reason I said the phone, right? Because most of us won't leave the house without our smartphone. But if you want to write it down, I don't care. So the first spiritual discipline that he brings out here, that was a good question, is prayer. You've got to have a prayer life, saints. Here's the second part. Spiritual discipline number two. Well, first, I don't want to skip over verse seven. Forgive me, it's too, too rich. I can't skip it. And the peace of God, which surpasses how much understanding? It will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. When I enter into that sanctuary of prayer with Christ, with the Holy Spirit, there's a peace that washes over me that nothing else can give me. Notice spiritual discipline number two. It comes in verse eight. Finally, brethren, whatever things are True, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, 
whatever things are of good report, if there's any virtue, and if there's anything praiseworthy, do what? Think on or meditate on these things. Where would you think the greatest source of purity, truth, virtuous, noble thought would be generated? Say it just a little louder. Has God not given us the most pure, joy, praiseworthy, virtuous set of writings ever known to man in the Word of God? For me, this is a call to study Scripture. Now, it doesn't mean that we couldn't read other inspirational things. Anybody in here like reading something from a lady called Ellen White? Yeah, I like reading Spirit of Prophecy. But shame on us if we read Ellen White and we don't read the Bible. Shame on us. Mrs. White would smack you on your hand. <laughs> Tell me I'm lying. Have you read some of her letters? She'd straighten her brother out in a heartbeat. In fact, she's on record saying if God's people studied their Bibles the way that they should, I would have never been called to this office. What's the last part? Prayer, reading our Bibles. Here's the third spiritual discipline. It comes out in verse 9. The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these what? Do. Be active. Share what you have learned. Be a blessing to someone else. Don't raise your hands, but how often, especially you, how often are you praying for divine appointments? I love divine appointments, and here's the thing about them. I didn't make them, so I don't know they're coming, and so when they happen, they're awesome. I had one happen this past Wednesday. I'd been going since I started going to the gym. I ended up messing up my shoulder a little bit and started doing some PT it was about my fourth visit, uh, third or fourth visit with my physical therapist. Her name is Molly. Come to find out she's a Catholic believer. Super sweet, super just personable person, really trying to help me. And, but she's, she's, she, by the second or third visit, she's asking me questions. This Wednesday, I'm laying face down. And you know those tables with the donut in them? <laughs> right? So, so I, I'm laying, she's got me in a tongue and starts asking me questions. <laughs> So I had to slide my towel aside, but she asked me, she said, did you study Latin in your preparation for pastoral ministry? I said, no, I did Greek and Hebrew. Oh, really? What kind of Greek? Because in her mind, she's thinking classical Greek. No, it was called Koine Greek, K-O-I-N-E. It's the common Greek. It was the common vernacular. Well, I've never heard of that. And she starts asking me, well, what about the Hebrew? And the next thing I know, my PT session turns into a Q&A with Pastor Bentley. We ended up, Bruce, all the way to theistic evolution. I don't even remember how we got there. But she asked me, she said, should Christians believe in evolution? How's that for a question from your physical therapist? I loved it. Jerry, I loved it. And I said, well, if God claims to be the author of life, why would he use death to create life? And if he told us that the wages of sin is death, but yet death existed before the first sin, wouldn't that make God a liar? She said, you know, I've never thought of that. That was a divine appointment, yes or no? I didn't orchestrate it. I didn't ask for it. I'm laying face down in the donut hole trying to get my shoulder fixed. In closing, where are you today? Where are you spiritually? I can't answer it for you. And maybe you've not assessed yourself honestly enough to be able to answer it yourself. I don't know. But do you feel like you're thriving spiritually? Or do you feel like you're drowning? Do you feel like things are going well in your walk with Christ? Or do you wish that there was more to it? Maybe... You have proximity to God, but you don't have connection with God. And my challenge to you is this, saints. Don't drown in shallow waters. It's going to be those little steps that we can take to be closer to God, and it's also going to be those little steps that take us closer away from God. Closer away, closer from, farther away from God is what I'm trying to say.
I don't know about you, but I do a lot of foolish things in my own life that I set myself up for failure. And I'm so thankful when God taps me on the shoulder and says, hey, there's a better way if you'll just follow me. I want to follow my Jesus. I want to have a prayer life. I want to spend time in his word. And I want to keep having those divine appointments because at the end of the day, I don't want to find myself spiritually drowning in shallow waters. How about you? Can I pray for you? Loving Father, as I think back on the tragedy that struck our friend's family, the loss of their son, Lord, I know their hearts are still tender at that loss. They say time heals all wounds, but Father, ultimately it's your touch and your touch alone that can bring healing. And I long for the day where we see George's resurrection. Lord, you know his heart. You know if that's what he will see next. And I just pray that it is for his sake and for his family. But Lord, here we are today and we have to make a decision about how we will go forward. We know about you. We're here. We know about the Sabbath. We have some understanding of spiritual things. But Father, maybe our relationship is shaky. Yeah, we survived the COVID shaking. But will we survive the next one? Are we teetering on the edge of separation from you and your people? Are we drowning, as it were, spiritually? Father, today, I pray that you would do as Jesus did for Peter. As the waves were crashing around him, he was about to perish because he took his eyes off Jesus. But Jesus reached out his hand. He rescued Peter and got him safely back in the boat. Father, today we may need that same rescue. Help us. Save us. Don't allow us to drown spiritually. Keep us safe with you. And may we choose to walk with you every day through prayer, through Bible study, and may we choose to be your witnesses everywhere you take us. For I ask these mercies in Jesus' name.